welcome to my channel. My name is Lisa Alistway, and on this channel, you will find a variety of inspirational and informational videos. So if that sounds good to you and you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. My guest today is Dr. James Greenblatt, who is a board certified psychiatrist and a pioneer in, in, in integrative medicine. He has authored seven books, including Finally Focused, the Breakthrough Natural Treatment Plan for ADHD. Dr. Greenblatt is also the founder of Psychiatry Re Redefined, which is an educational platform dedicated to the transformation of psychiatry. I will be linking his website down below for your reference. Welcome, Dr. Greenblatt. Thank you for having me. It's good to be with you. Yes. So would you like to add anything else to that introduction on your background? Uh, no, I mean, I've been... Um... A traditionally trained psychiatrist practicing over 30 years. And, and during that time, uh, been able to utilize a lot of natural integrative therapies for the treatment of, uh, you know, many major psychiatric illnesses. Fantastic. So you are a pioneer in integrative medicine. Is that similar to what we know as complementary alternative medicine? Yeah, I think the terms of change started off as alternative and then complementary was added, and then, you know, functional, integrative, it's all kind of um, looking at, at a different approach. And uh, I like the words integrative and functional because we haven't given up our conventional treatments, but psychiatry really is lacking in a holistic perspective, and that's what we're hoping to add. Very good. Um, so today's topic is all around adult ADHD. Can we just start off with defining what exactly is ADHD? Sure. I, th I think it's um, uh, the term is thrown around a lot. We've um, been uh, talking about it for a couple hundred years in the literature. If these are were typically kids that were uh, overactive, impulsive, and had difficulty paying attention. And uh, early on in my training, we just assumed it disappeared and it in adults. Uh, but over the past 20 years, it's quite clear that ADHD is a, is a medical disorder. It's kind of brain-based, uh, based on physiology in the brain, and that it doesn't disappear. It affects adults and has significant impairment in one's life, many aspects of one's life we can talk about. So um, I guess I read somewhere that one in three uh, of kids who have ADHD go into remission. Is that, that's not true? This is like a lifelong issue for that individual? Well, I think, um, you know, remission is probably not the right word, but the, the symptoms of ADHD are, are not kind of feeling symptoms. They're actually in some environments can be very helpful. So the symptoms of ADHD, meaning um, short attention span, which also means you can make a lot of quick decisions, Impulsive means you might be a great boss or entrepreneur. Um, so it's just different environments. So we see it a lot in school because kids are sitting there paying attention to things they're not interested in. And the ones that you describe disappear are typically people have found an environment where the symptoms are just less concerning and maybe even helpful. A lot of our ADHD adults are passionate and creative and energetic and those kind of magnetic personalities, which in school might get you in trouble, but in certain work environments, you'll excel. Mm. So how does ADHD differ between adults and children? Is there any differing characteristics, symptoms, manifestations between the ages? Well, you know, uh, not significant other than the biggest one would be the kind of overactivity, the hyperactivity that you might see in a, in a child becomes more of an internal uh, restlessness. Um, so adults need to, their brain is thinking or they're moving or they're internally restless. So they're not up and running around their seats, um, but that internal state of restlessness might be the biggest one. But the, the symptoms persist and uh, the most concerning thing is um, most adults with um, ADHD uh, never work up to their kind of intellectual or professional potential um, because these symptoms can impair many aspects of their lives. 
Yes, I, I have a short list of symptoms. I'm going to see if you want to add anything to this. Impulsive, disorganized, poor time management, problem focus, uh, focusing on tasks, trouble multitasking, poor planning, low frustration toler tolerance, excessive activity or restlessness, um, impulsiveness. Anything else you would add to that list? No, I mean, that covers it. But think about those, the implications of how that will affect your life. And Mm -hmm. The other part of that equation is we have very good research demonstrating adults with ADHD have worse job performance, lower socioeconomic, more divorces, marital problems, financial problems. Uh, the, the list, you know, is quite extensive. And this is now based on research. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the toll that it can take on home and relationships, whether it is at work or with a personal relationship, because if people go throughout life, especially if they're undiagnosed and may not even be aware that they have this problem. And then the people that are having to be around individuals that aren't getting help for that problem, you know, as you can say, could lead to loss of employment, loss of um, livelihoods and also uh, divorces. And we know all of the problems that come out of that. Yeah, it's, it's kind of uh, can be overwhelming. And as you said, most of the time, it's because there's not an understanding of the diagnosis, either diagnosis wasn't made or the, the partner or spouse just doesn't understand it. And I think when you begin to understand um, what it means and what it looks like, not only we become more empathic, but you can kind of appreciate the strengths and minimize kind of the areas of weakness. Yeah, because some of the characteristics mimic narcissism and so sometimes if you're in a relationship with somebody with ADHD, you don't know that they have ADHD, you might be taking on the extra work in the household, become very resentful, um, and you might feel like you're the only one responsible in the party. So these are all issues that are compounded when you don't have an understanding and a diagnosis of it. Yes, it, it can be overwhelming and, and certainly marital problems are the, what we see the most. But the other part of that equation is um, the, the real kind of assault on self-esteem for that individual who feels, you know, blamed in the relationship, that individual that feels that they're not able to get the promotion or do well at work or lose jobs and um, probably been going on most of their life. So that uh, self-esteem is a major risk factor for depression and other psychological problems. Yeah, yeah. So it's 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 definitely an interesting issue and one to uh, to recognize if it is happening in a relationship, whether it's work or personal. Um, so let's get to what causes ADHD. Well, uh, you know the the big picture is it's it's uh, likely genetic. Uh, it tends to run in families, so there's a genetic predisposition. So is there a gene that they've identified? Well, for almost all of the psychiatric illnesses. When we say genetics, we don't have a gene. There are probably mm -hmm. multiple genes um, that are related, but the family histories are quite striking. Um, and most of the adults that we end up treating, they're initially bringing their child in for treatment and they see some of the behaviors or the changes when the child is treated and they say, well, that was me or that's how I'm functioning. So, so the genetics kind of sets the, the course or the foundation, but in our work as a integrative doctors, um, we have found a whole host of nutritional deficiencies and food allergies and other environmental um, kind of stressors that can make these symptoms uh, much worse. So one that I would like to uh, address with you is child abuse and neglect as being a potential um, cause of ADHD. What are your thoughts on that? Well, certainly um, abuse and, and neglect and trauma can look like ADHD. So somebody could have um, symptoms of inattention, might be impulsive, might be overactive, but they're, they're likely separate processes. Um, so trauma versus ADHD, uh, one doesn't cause the other, but they can coexist. And certainly some of the symptoms uh, overlap. Okay. What about um, brain injury? Uh, absolutely. We see, um, uh, you know, head injury uh, affecting uh, behavior and attention. And um, very clearly, it can appear like 
uh, an adult with ADHD. But again, want to distinguish because we, we might treat a head injury different than somebody with a family history of ADHD or had ADHD as a child and is just now being seen as an adult. But the symptoms of a short attention span, impulsivity, uh, and internal restlessness um, could be very similar. Okay. And what about um, maternal drug use? Uh, we, we know there's lots of um, uh, kind of uh, maternal from substance abuse um, that would clearly affect uh, psychiatric illness and ADHD, uh, probably being one of those, yes. Okay. Um, and so how is it diagnosed? Well, it really is a clinical diagnosis. So for much of psychiatry, we have um, a list of symptoms. And, and for the ADHD, we talked about the poor attention span, uh, uh, impulsiveness, overactivity. And um, so it's a clinical diagnosis. There's, there's no test. You know, some people look at uh, psychological testing, um, which is not often uh, helpful because the environment can affect some of the symptoms. So one-on-one, -on -one, an individual might do really well with testing, psychological testing, but in a school environment do very poorly. So it is essentially a clinical diagnosis with some helpful tools that we can use to uh, assess attention and uh, impulse control. So you go through the, using the DSM, the Diastolic Statistical Manual, as far as diagnosing? Yes, at this point, that's as good as we get in terms of um, making a diagnosis of uh, ADHD in kids or adults, yes. Okay. Now, why is it higher in boys than girls? Uh, we don't have a really clear uh, explanation. It's an observation. Um, but I think uh, what has happened is uh, the girls and, and women are just um, are missed. I think it's very underdiagnosed because oftentimes the girls are not as hyperactive, so they don't get labeled or in uh, elementary school as problem. They're inattentive, um, they, but they're, it might be impulsive. And um, so they don't get diagnosed early. And then in high school, we've actually seen there's an association between eating disorders and ADHD. Again, clearly more boys than girls, but I think the, the girls have just been underdiagnosed. Oh, so what is the connection between the eating disorders and ADHD? Well, we know there's a higher incidence of um, uh, what we call binge eating disorder and, um, and obesity. Uh, what we see uh, a lot, I've seen for many, many years, is um, you know girls undiagnosed with ADHD. So their their schoolwork is okay, but they're impulsive. Uh, they don't pay attention well, and and then they start binging on food, and they don't have the same impulse control to stop eating, mm -hmm. and that kind of creates a cycle of disordered eating that some end up uh, with a diagnosed eating disorder. Interesting. Um, so let's talk about some of the ramifications of having ADHD. I was reading about that it could possibly lead to things like lower life expectancy of developing other personality disorders, Parkinson's disease, dementia. What, are you, what do you know about that, like consequences long-term? You know, I think some of those are very minimal studies. I don't think it's quite clear um, uh, about any of those, I think they're all kind of speculative. I think what is clear over the literature for many, many years is that there's impaired, as we talked about, job performance, relationships, um, and, and self-esteem that affects their lives. Some of the relationships to other illnesses, you know, scattering of research, not you know, well documented. And I think the um, other personality disorders would not develop out of ADHD. Personality disorders are more characterological, but certainly the symptoms of ADHD just will affect so many aspects of your life. It can um, really get in the way of relationships and people might see you as having a difficult uh, personality. Okay. Um, so let's talk about treatment, starting with traditional medication. Um, what are your thoughts on traditional medication being used to treat ADHD? 
Well, I mean, we know the current medications uh, work. They're effective, 89%, but they're, they're Band-Aids. They're essentially amphetamines, um, Ritalin, Adderall, Vyvanse. Um, these are amphetamines that do improve the symptoms um, for many uh, kids with ADHD and, and adults. But as soon as you stop the medicine, the symptoms come back. So our work as an integrative doctor is trying to find the underlying causes um, so we don't have to use the Band-Aids, um, which are the medicines. But again, as, as a psychiatrist, uh, we use them in kids that are really struggling and we occasionally use them in adults. I try not to use um, these medications in adults um, if we don't have to, because there are some natural remedies that work well. Um, but if someone is really struggling, certainly trying to get through college, we would definitely um, support medications. Yeah, I was reading that uh, some of the uh, problems that can exist when you come off of the drug is uh, individuals are finding that they're gaining weight, um, that they're possibly becoming depressed, having drug withdrawal. So there's lots of side effects um, from taking the drugs once you get off of them. There, there can be. I mean, I think um, uh, the, most of the side effects are taking too high a dose um, for a long period of time. So the goal is the kind of lowest dose without side effects. And um, some people will have side effects and, and some people won't. So do some people plan on taking the drugs for the rest of their life? Well, that's my concern with adults because um, if it's just a Band-Aid, it's only symptomatic relief, um, that really doesn't make sense because then they're taking amphetamines for the rest of their life. So we try to, one, uh, one change your environment. If they're in a job where they're an accountant and they can't sit still, maybe that's not the best job because um, the environment really dictates a lot of the symptoms. Mm -hmm. And, and there are also, as I said, a number of other natural remedies uh, for adults who might not be stuck in situations like boring schoolwork where medications might not be necessary. Yeah, what is the um, long-term effects of things like methamphetamine on the brain? Well, you know, there's certainly uh, methamphetamines as a toxic drug is, is dangerous. It, it destroys brain cells. But some of the pharmaceutical prescriptions, you know, we don't know of any significant long-term effects. Um, but we certainly are worried about when you're changing the neurotransmitters and the receptors in the brain over long periods of time, it, it has to have uh, an effect. But we just don't collect that kind of data and that research. Okay. Um, I was going to ask you also, what do you say to the critics who say ADHD is not really a thing? You know, it's it's certainly frustrating specializing in this field for 30 years because it's just heartbreaking. Some of listening to some of these kids that are bright, that again can't function or socially ostracized, and and even as we're talking about the adults that are intelligent, smart, creative, um, but just struggling. And then you watch them treated, and you see, you know, is it someone who's can't see well, but it's like putting on their glasses or somebody. Um, just transforms. So it's hard to convince uh, certain individuals that, you know, can just call these individuals lazy um, and not motivated. And, um, but I've been doing this thousands and thousands of patients and it's truly remarkable. And you see the change because it is a brain-based illness to, to support attention, to control impulses. That is brain-based behavior. Okay. So um, we talked about the traditional medication. Now let's talk about some of the non-pharmacological routes to treating ADHD, which you are very familiar with, with your integrative medicine. Um, what are some of the areas that you suggest um, for non-medication? Yeah, I mean, the list is, is quite extensive because everyone's different. And I think that's the challenge for people um, yeah. either just reading a book or listening to a podcast or going into a health food store. Um, so our approach is, is testing, looking, um, because for some individuals, it might be, uh, certainly kids, we see a lot of uh, high copper and lead uh, that can affect behavior. Uh, for adults, we also see so, uh, a lot of times copper. So heavy metals can be a problem. Food allergies can be a problem. Um, what, what specific food allergies are we talking about? It could be anything. For person A, it could be uh, dairy. 
Person B, it could be tomatoes and corn. So we, we do see that. What uh, about the, uh, the dyes, the yellow dye, red dye? Yeah, when I started, it was called the fine gold diet. Um, you know, the, uh, it was very popular and, and the, the research community finally did a study and they said it has no effect, these uh, chemical uh, dyes and additives. And that was in the 80s. Uh, but then 20 years later, as the more research has been done, we've been able to find a subset of these kids and adults are um, sensitive to the food additives and food dyes. So like many of the things I listed, um, there are a subset of individuals that are gonna have worse behavior if they're eating you know, the red dyes and the yellow dyes and the food additives, but it doesn't mean every child or every adult would be sensitive to those dyes. Okay, what about sugar? Sugar, you know, when I started, the research said there was no association, even though every parent knew um, there was, and now we have pretty good research that there's a dramatic relationship between refined sugar and, and most of the research is on what's called sugar sweetened beverages, you know, the Cokes and the sodas. And the more, uh, most of these are on children and adolescents, but the more uh, sugar sweetened beverages per day, the much higher incidence of ADHD. Mm -hmm. um, what about uh, omega-3 fatty acids? Yeah, we, we've seen a subset of kids um, that, that are deficient when we do testing. And, and there's pretty good research that there are individuals that do better uh, on omega-3s. But just like the dyes, it's not every ADHD child um, who takes fish oil is gonna do better. Mm -hmm. But we've seen a number of kids improve, particularly those kids that might have allergies, those kids that might have skin problems um, are kind of associated with the omega-3 deficiencies. Okay, and what about correcting the microbiome, the gut? Um, same thing, there is a subset where that is the problem. We're able to detect um, certain chemicals um, that are produced from bacteria in the gut and, and they affect behavior profoundly. And so if we detect these um, chemicals, we can treat the gut and, and the ADHD symptoms can improve dramatically. Okay, um, anything else with nutrition? Um, yeah, there are uh, certain B vitamins that can be very helpful. Um, a lot of kids that are eating sugar kind of uh, have a higher need for B vitamins. And probably the most common nutritional deficiency that we see in a, both adults and kids with ADHD is magnesium deficiency. Mm -hmm. And that is, um, uh, again, probably the most common. The research studies looked at 90, 95% of individuals with ADHD benefit from magnesium supplementation. Okay, so it'd be advisable to get like a nutrition panel to see, you know, what you might be lacking in these particular vitamins and minerals. Absolutely, it can make a huge difference. Okay, so another area that you talk a lot about as far as treatment is exercise. Can you uh, expound on that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, for so many of our psychiatric illnesses um, in kids and adults, exercise is by far best medicine and the research supports it. I think for depression, um, sometimes it's hard to get the uh, adults or kids motivated, but if they do, it helps. But ADHD, um, parents have reported and the research as well, is that exercise improves attention and, and focus. So the more we can uh, get uh, those with ADHD exercising, um, the, the better that they feel. And, and they'll notice it and they'll be able to tell you if they hurt their knee or they can't exercise for a week their attention and their symptoms tend to get worse. Yes, and, um, and martial arts is probably one of the best things you can get involved with, whether you're a child or an adult with ADHD, because it does make you focus on the present moment of what you're doing. Um, and I think, and also you get to kind of get rid of that restlessness by exerting some energy. Yes, a lot of parents you know, can't believe that my child's not gonna be able to be in the class or a lot of adults feel I'm not gonna be able to listen. Uh, but they do incredibly well uh, with all the martial arts. And there's actually some research supporting that. So absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, so what about sleep interventions? Uh, sleep is a common symptom of ADHD in adults or kids. 
And uh, as the sleep problems get worse, the ADHD symptoms get worse. Mm -hmm. So as a physician, one of the most important things we can do for adults with ADHD um, is help regulate a sleep cycle. Um, it's not just education, because many people know they should be sleeping more, but part of the ADHD syndrome, some of it I believe is related to the magnesium deficiency, is just getting to sleep is difficult. So we really work with uh, individuals on both sleep hygiene and any uh, nutritional support, herbal support to uh, help enhance sleep. Fantastic. What about uh, meditation? I would imagine it'd be very hard with this population to, uh, to meditate. Yeah, you would think so, but, but mindfulness might be an easier term because again, they're both good research supporting mindfulness program with adults with ADHD and kids. And oftentimes uh, we would use like walking mindfulness. So someone doesn't have to necessarily mm -hmm. sit still in a meditative pose for 30 minutes, but you can teach mindfulness uh, with, with movement, whether it's walking in the woods, we know also nature uh, supports enhanced attention, um, but mindfulness uh, can be a key component to really uh, transitioning uh, adults into more focused behaviors and better impulse control. Good. What about um, cognitive behavioral therapy, just like talk therapy so that they can talk to somebody maybe about some of the childhood issues or trauma that they've incurred that they're not addressing or coping with um, and coping with it in negative ways. Would that be a helpful intervention as well? You know, I, th I think a lot of um, uh, individuals are in therapy and um, are not finding it kind of supporting the, the change. So I think for change um, and, and uh, a coach is probably a better term for those with ADHD because they really need those external support. But absolutely, as you described, uh, talking about some of the consequences of what it was like and the self-esteem issues and the relationship issues um, is very helpful. And, and ADHD um, with a couple um, in couples therapy can really be uh, saving of a relationship. But in terms of the, the, the best results we've seen for adults is really working with a coach because it's not kind of knowing what to do. It's, you know, it's doing what they know. And sometimes the coach can really provide support about whether it's helping with childcare or relationships or job performance. That's so interesting. I was going to ask you like the difference between like going and talking to like a psychologist or a psychiatrist about your problems versus going to a life coach. What would you get from one that you don't get from the other? Would you say? Well, if you did, if you went with a coach, you'd want to make sure someone knows ADHD. So not all life coaches understand ADHD. So you want to go to someone who knows ADHD because they're the ones that are going to appreciate that you started six projects and haven't finished one. <laughs> they're, they're the ones that's going to appreciate, you know, you forgot to pick up your child. I mean, this mm. is, um, and, and help you. So it's not just a life coach. And, um, and it just can be practical, you know, reminders, um, as, as well as practical skills. The, the psychotherapy part is, you know, articulating the feelings, which is just as helpful and just as important. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's funny, that example that you gave. Um, looking at modern society and with like all the technology, you know, shortening our attention spans and social media and, you know, frying our brains. And I imagine a lot of people think they have ADHD when it quite is maybe something else, but do you think a lot of the factors in today's society with technology is contributing to the rise of it? Or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I think we're all geared to these, you know, short bursts of, of attention and stimulation and the screens, and it certainly compounds things tremendously. And certainly, you know, when I see the infants on, on the screens, um, oh. you know, we, we know this uh, relationships between that early screen time and attention. Um. Yeah, no doubt. Um, so we talked about nutrition, we talked about exercise, sleep, meditation, mindfulness, what other non-pharmacological interventions, also talk therapy, um, what other non-pharmacological uh, interventions would you recommend as far as treating ADHD? Uh, well, there's some, you know, herbal uh, 
solutions that we have found very helpful. Um, there's an herb called rhodiola, which kind of stimulates um, a dopamine in the brain, and that's been very helpful for adults with ADHD. And then there's a collection of um, herbs, phytochemicals called OPCs, and, and those are the colors in some of our fruits and vegetables. And so we think of grape seed extract and blueberry extract, and um, and and those have been have been using them since the '90s. They're very helpful for uh, helping uh, improve attention, particularly in adults. So there are adults where you know we don't use medications, but they're struggling, and a combination of these um, chemicals, this herb rhodiola, and these OPCs that you can buy you know over the counter and really support uh, attention. So I know that they are not regulated by the FDA or approved by the FDA. So that becomes, I guess, somewhat an issue for some people that don't want to take herbs, for example. Um, what would you say to them about that? Uh, absolutely, you gotta be careful. The quality is not regulated, but there are companies that have very strong uh, quality assurance programs and you know what's in them. And that's why either speaking with a, a, you know, a physician or finding someone who knows which companies, but you're absolutely right. Just going to a, a local drugstore and buying um, herbs and supplements, you have no idea what you're getting is what is in the bottle. What about medicinal marijuana to treat ADHD? I've not found it helpful. And I, I'd say most people would say it'd probably make it worse you know, in terms of the attention span over time. There might be some calming of overactivity and impulse control. And certainly there are individuals who report, I can only work when I'm, you know, high. Um, but this, uh, in the long run, most of the research is saying that's probably detrimental. Yeah, definitely for your short-term memory, um, there's a lot of research pointing to that. Right. Um, any other uh, non-pharmacological interventions you'd recommend if somebody's struggling with ADHD? I think we, we've touched on a couple uh, ways, but just to reiterate the uh, couples therapy for adults um, or for a, uh, a, a young adult with parents mm -hmm. and their families, because education is kind of the most effective way of, of understanding this. It's, um, you know, some people might see it as a disability. Some people might see it as a personality trait, but either way, you have to understand what the disorder is to both appreciate the strengths um, that these individuals carry. Again, these are people that you probably want in your team. They're creative, they're passionate. If they really enjoy what they're doing, they're going to be hyper-focused. Um, and, and so education, any way that you can provide it is probably the most effective tool we can to help. Yeah. Just thinking about like the workplace. I know we have like employee assistance programs that help people with substance abuse problems. And sometimes that can be correlated with ADHD because they may be using that as a coping mechanism. Um, and so in the workplace, just, you know, being aware of addressing, you know, one issue might also need to address another issue that's related to it. Yeah. I think in, in the old days, we used to worry that treating kids with ADHD or adolescents would cause substance abuse because you're giving amphetamines. But the early research, and, and now we've confirmed it, it's actually treating ADHD, whether it's natural means or medicine, will actually prevent substance abuse. Because just imagine if you're not able to get through college and you're not doing well in your relationships, as you said, getting high might be a coping mechanism. But if you're treated and it, it, doesn't matter what the treatment is, you're going to do better in life and feel better about yourself and less likely to get involved in drugs. Yeah. Do you think it's still stigmatized in certain ways in our society? ADHD? Yeah. Well, a absolutely for adults. You know, I think the, mm -hmm. um, the kids, I think um, there's certainly a group that feels it's overdiagnosed, some that's underdiagnosed, but certainly people are aware of it. I think the muddy waters is college where, you know, kids aren't paying attention. They did fine through high school and then they're being thrown on amphetamines and stimulants. And then there's a very uh, large population of college kids that are abusing amphetamines, either their roommates or their friends. Mm -hmm. So 
the college community is a, uh, kind of a muddy water. But, um, and then adults, I believe that most people don't really appreciate that it not only exists in many adults, but it's underdiagnosed and undertreated. Mm -hmm. And so your integrated approach means that you can still use the medication as well as some of these um, non-medication routes or the, or no medication and just the, um, the, uh, non or the non-pharmacological routes. Is that correct? It's kind of a, a piece menu. You have to look at the individual and see what's going to work with that individual. Yeah. I mean, it really has turned out to be particularly as our testing gets better, a personalized, you know, approach. And, um, depending on the severity of the symptoms, depending on where they are in their life, someone who's trying to get through high school is, or college is different than somebody who's working. And, and based on all those factors and, you know, the therapeutic alliance we have with our patients, what, what do they want? Um, it's very individualized, but yes, we can use all the tools in the toolbox. It's not just a amphetamine and, you know, we're treating ADHD. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm so glad to see your model because I think a lot of times people might just think psychiatry, just go there for, it got all the good drugs. But um, I'm glad you're seeing that it's more than just drugs. You have to address other areas of your lifestyle that might be, you know, affecting how you're feeling, whether it's the sleep, the exercise, the diet, they can all manifest in the body differently. Yeah, I mean, too much of psychiatry is just symptom-based, whether it's depression, antidepressants, or for ADHD, just these amphetamines. And there are more and more drug companies making more amphetamines because they know it's a market. Um, so it is kind of a sad reflection of the field of psychiatry of just using medications and not looking deeper. Mm -hmm. So are you becoming more the norm for your field to have this integrative approach, or are you still kind of in the minority in psychiatry to have this integrated approach? Well, I would like to think it's the norm, but it's not quite there. I think our training of psychiatrists is still heavily based on just medications, our treatment models, what the insurance companies reimburse, uh, how doctors are setting up their office. It's still, and it's not just the United States, it's across the globe. Psychiatry is primarily um, handing out prescriptions for symptom relief. Okay. And as far as the name ADHD, um, do, you, do you like that? Is that the most useful name or is there a better name for this? Because like it ends in disorder. Some would say, no, it's more like a response or a disease or, or do you like the word that it is disorder? Well, I, I guess I'm used to it and um, so I'm comfortable with it. What has been interesting to me is the history of the hundred, last hundred years, the name has changed about 10 times, you know, from brain dysfunction to minimal brain dysfunction to separating hyperactivity with or without attention problems. So the name keeps changing, but I think ADHD um, kind of fits because it, it, it um, the name has been around for a while now and we understand that some kids have attention problems, some kids are more impulsive, some kids are more overactive um, and you can have a kind of mixture of all of the above. Okay, and do you think it will, um, will see more ADHD or less in the future? Uh I think we're seeing more of all psychiatric illnesses between um, the everything from the chemicals in the environment to the stress, to the screens, to the diet. Absolutely, uh, all the major psychiatric illnesses appear to be increasing and certainly ADHD is probably part of that package. Okay, and um, one last thing I was gonna touch on just going back to just, I think that a lot of things have its root in trauma and the child abuse and neglect, you had mentioned that it's it's not a direct relationship, but it could be side by side with ADHD. Is that correct? Yeah, the symptoms, uh, absolutely. Somebody who's, who's had a trauma, um, someone who's had neglect, that they're going to have the same, the list of symptoms, um, the inattention, uh, probably poor impulse control and mm -hmm. restlessness. So the symptoms could look the same, but if you miss that there was trauma, the treatment approach might get skewed because amphetamines aren't going to uh, necessarily help as much um, other than maybe some symptomatic relief. So you really want to understand the symptoms could be the same. 
Yeah, because I, I assume like to work through the trauma, the abuse, the neglect, that takes a lot of time. That takes a lot uh, more than just, you know, a session or two. And I think maybe some people are quicker to just, here, here, take this drug and you'll feel better than have to like look at the root of those issues. Yeah, I mean, that's the problem with all of psychiatry now, exactly, not addressing the root, either psychological and or biological. Yeah. And it's, I mean, we definitely live in a more modernized society and all the conveniences, but there's a lot of trauma in our society as well. A lot of traumatized people, traumatized culture um, that I think is definitely needs to be improved and addressed. And um, I think uh, people are not paying attention to it enough. Absolutely. It's, um, you know, our children aren't uh, being nurtured you know, with families and extended families the way um, we're used to. And uh, it's very uh, troubling as a child psychiatrist seeing the kinds of things that, that we see um, based on uh, trauma and neglect as you're describing. Yeah, and then that, that trauma and neglect gets passed down intergenerationally. You have that intergenerational trauma, just so you had mentioned how ADHD could be seen in the father and also seen in the son. And passed down, so some of those those dra- those traumas are projected um, from generation to generation, and so sometimes I think we're very unconscious of these things that are happening in our society, and uh, we're quick to just say, "Here, medicate, put a label on it, and go on." You know, right? Absolutely, yes. Most definitely. Uh, so we're getting here to the end of our conversation. Uh, do you have any final thoughts on um, ADHD for adults or even children for that matter? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just important that um, everyone understands that there are kind of, uh, even though the symptoms might be the same, there could be many underlying causes and looking, uh, help getting a professional to help you look at some of those underlying causes could be very dramatic um, in improving symptoms. And the most important one is stopping blaming yourself because it, we do know it's a biologically based disorder that the receptors in the brain and the neurotransmitters in the brain are working differently. And so if you can appreciate that it's not your fault, um, then it, you get rid of the self-blame and begin to look at uh, lifestyle and or you know, different modes of treatment to support uh, improving those symptoms. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Dr. Greenblatt. I appreciate you coming on uh, today and sharing your knowledge. And I appreciate that you're looking at uh, treatments beyond medication. I think that's a much needed conversation that needs to be had more in doctor's offices and psychiatrist offices. So I really appreciate what you're doing. Great. Thanks for having me. Take care. Yes. If you guys like this video, be sure and give it a thumbs up and don't forget to share and subscribe and hit the bell to be alerted to when the next video drops. Thanks for watching.